Well, good evening and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, and here on EWTN, we have this great privilege on this program to hear a story, to hear the gospel played out uh, in the life of one of God's children. Tonight, we're joined by Mother Petra. She's a nun of Christ the Bridegroom Monastery in Northeast Ohio. I should have said that beforehand to make sure I had the right. Uh, and she's a former Wesleyan. And you can find out more about the order at Christ thebridegroom.org. Mother Petra, thank you for joining us thank tonight. You. It's good to be here. Really appreciate you coming to share your story, uh, both your story of coming to Catholic, but we'll also hear a little bit you know, later on too about, about your order and about uh, that story. But great, great to be here with you tonight. It's a great joy. Oh, well, okay. Well, let's go back to the beginning. Where were you brought up and what was your spiritual background? I grew up around Indiana until I was in middle school. Okay. Um, so I was from a very Wesleyan family. My, okay. my grandpa was a pastor. My aunts all married pastors on one side of the family. Cousins on the other side are pastors. Um, now missionaries, great uncle, like just a lot of ministry in right. my family. Um, and took that very much, not for granted in a bad way, but like that's what we were. And it life. didn't occur to me once, you know, once in a while there would be rumblings I would overhear with the adults of like, well, you know, so-and-so, they, they're they um, eternal security people. So like I had an idea that there were like a different kinds of Christians, but a pretty solid like, well, it, what it means to be Christian is to be Wesleyan, right? Um, and so a pretty solid mm -hmm. growing up years. Um, and yet for me, there was often a an insecurity there of, so Wesleyans are Armenian. Right. Um, we emphasize free will as opposed to eternal security. Um, and so for me, that led growing up to this sense of, I was never sure it took. Like there's a period of years um, when every night I would repray the Jesus prayer before I, not the Jesus prayer, the sinner's prayer before sure. I went to sleep. Um, because I just wasn't sure it took because I didn't, feel different. I didn't right. feel like it took. Um, but I didn't mention this to anybody. I thought this was just like, it's supposed to have worked. And so I hope it did. Um, but other than that kind of undercurrent of insecurity, I guess is the only, yeah. the only word I could use, but I didn't want to acknowledge that to myself. And so it wasn't like sure. triggering questions. Yeah. But you had a prayer life, clearly. You were yes. praying that prayer. Um, we so did you had a family sense of devotions. Yeah. Um, once I got to be maybe 12, I started to read the Bible every day because this is what a good Christian does. Like I, It's beautiful to think of my grandparents and my aunts and uncles and my parents and just seeing them every morning with their cup of coffee yeah. and their Bible. Like This is how you have a relationship with the Lord. And so I knew this is what I needed. Um, I remember the first time my parents bought me like an adult Bible, the kind with your name embossed, not like the New Adventure Bible or whatever, but like right. the real Bible. Um, and there was something about the dignity of that leather book of like, okay, this is, now I'm old enough, I think I was 12, to like read this, which meant I was constantly going to my dad with questions because what is this? Like, why is this happening? <laughs> um, but he always took my questions very seriously and wasn't afraid to say, well, I don't know. <laughs> um, so that carried me through. And then when I was about 16, we got involved with a church plant. Um, I don't think I'd really been aware of church planting before that time as like a phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, so we had moved to Ohio just about around this time, a couple, a year or so before. And there weren't Wesleyan churches close to us in Ohio. So we started going to a 3C, um, count, 3CU, Churches of Christ and Christian Union. Ah. Um, which was pretty much indistinguishable theologically from Westland's church government was a little bit different into sure. a Nazarene church. Um, but it's all in the same like family of yeah. faith. And so it didn't make much of a difference theologically. So um, at the beginning of the church planting experience, um, I wasn't baptized. I'm 16 and I'm not baptized. And my sister was baptized twice. I know lots of people who are baptized twice hmm. because um, they would do it as like a six-year-old and then they would do it when they really meant it when they were later in middle school or high school because we were taught that baptism is an, um, it's like a public act of claiming the faith for your, for your own. Um, but every time my parents approached me about being baptized, I had a horror of being in front of people. Like I just didn't, if I could have done it privately, which a Catholic would have done it privately, right? right. Um, but that just was never done. It was always done 
in a big service. And so I just kept putting it off and kept putting it off. And my parents would approach me like, do you want to be baptized? And I would tell them, well, if it's just a public sign, if it doesn't have any bearing on my soul, then I'm not going to do it. Um, and they couldn't argue with that. So they're, they're, I think, uncomfortable that I'm not baptized, but I'm just, I'm, I'm not willing to do it because I'm too shy, I think is what I would have said. Yeah. So um, about the age of 16, I'm reading the Bible and Jesus is very clear about saying you need to be baptized. And so I just need to get over myself and let it be done. So as part of our, our journey into this church plant, um, they had their first baptism service. And so I was baptized in a pool um, at a neighbor's house in 50 degree weather with these other, um, the pastors, one of his daughters, and then some adult converts. Um, and that's really, I didn't even realize this until maybe, probably since I came to the monastery, Theophany, the baptism of the Lord is a really important feast for us. Um, and reflecting how during my baptism, I had no awareness that something changed. Um, because if baptism is only an outward sign, there's not a change in your soul. But if baptism is how the Holy Spirit comes to indwell you, this is a big deal. And the humility of God that he is doing that work in me when it's entirely hidden from me. Right. I leave that pool that day with no sense, felt sense, that something's actually changed in me. And yet that's the beginning of the deepening of everything that led me into the church. Right. We're joined tonight by Mother Petra, a nun of Christ the Bridegroom Monastery in Northeast Ohio. It, it is interesting, we, you know, in, in different denominations, in different Christian circles, we have these sort of remnants, these sacraments, mm -hmm. but, but sometimes the practicalities brush us up against the theological nuances of, yeah, yeah what, what does baptism really do? Mm -hmm. Is this just the public sign or is there something different going on? And mm -hmm. we don't always have the answers to those questions. We can, maybe we can't even articulate them yet, but they're, they're there under the surface. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. So about that point, um, and through the experience of being involved in this church plant, um, there were two kind of cracks in my, what I thought was like a really firm foundation of faith. Yeah. Um, the first one seems rather insignificant, but it actually led to like the, the real turning point. Um, and that is, <laughs> so I was raised in, eschatology, a premillennial dispensationalist eschatology. Um, For those who aren't familiar with what that So means. it's the idea yeah. that like the Lord will return, there will be a rapture, and then there will be a tribulation for those who are left, and then he will return again. And I mean, there's even timelines for these things written right. out. My parents didn't emphasize this, I think because this was disturbing to my, my parents are both Catholic now. Mm -hmm. So as I say these things, yeah. um, that was disturbing to my dad as a child and so he didn't want to do that to us i guess um and yet i'm absorbing it hugely from grandparents aunts and uncles from the teaching at our church um so in high school i'm reading through um matthew 24 and i'm i'm just like there's only one return i remember going to my dad and saying i i don't understand like jesus comes back and there's the judgment and this eschatology is drawn from Revelation and from Daniel and a lot of gymnastics. It comes from the Schofield Study Bible footnotes, so only in the past like 150 years. Right. Um, but I'm thinking, like I was taught, this is what Christianity is. But I'm reading scripture and I'm like, it's just so plain in the gospel and that's not what I'm seeing. So I'm taking these questions to my dad and he ends up giving me an article. The Westland Church had a I don't know if they still publish it. It was like a magazine that came out quarterly called The Triangle. And there was an article specifically about end time eschatology. And it said, the Wesleyan Church has no teaching on this. You can either be a premillennialist, a postmillennialist, or an amillennialist. I didn't know there was a term for what I was experiencing, um, which was amillennialist. I also didn't know that the Catholic Church is amillennial. But I was like, oh, well then that's what I am. I felt like I was, I, I think I was the only one that I knew at that point in my life who um, believed that, but that was this, this beginning of, if this is so important, shouldn't there be a teaching and not, well, you can believe any of these things. Um, and so that was the beginning of this unease of, I need an answer 
not just, oh, any of these answers are fine, I need an answer. And so that was the beginning of this need for authority, but I didn't recognize it for what it was at the time. Sure. Um, and then through the church plan experience, um, very exciting at the beginning, we're meeting in a, a, a gymnasium at a local school, and the church plan experience, um, for those who aren't familiar with it, it's the idea of setting up a seeker-friendly service so that people who are unchurched can come in, hear the gospel in a way that's accessible to them, um, and then hopefully meet Christ, um, have their lives changed. But through the course of this, I started to have this unease of I felt like every Sunday we were putting on a show, like we were trying to sell the gospel. We were, we were trying to reduce it to a cultural denominator that was palatable. And I didn't have the language to articulate this at the time. The way I would have said it is that we were emphasizing programs instead of people. But actually, something that's a little off there is like, we were emphasizing people. We were emphasizing our preferences and our tastes and the image we wanted to put forth. When like the gospel is not palatable. The gospel is about a man on a cross and we have to follow him to that cross before our resurrection. And so that, that was the beginning of like a disillusionment maybe. Mm -hmm. That's a strong word because I don't think I was bitter. I was more frustrated of where is the gospel of doubt? Where is the church that I'm seeking? So shortly after that, I go to Indiana Wesleyan University. Um, I grew up going there for conferences, just always I was there. Um, sure. My sister was there. She was a senior when I went in as a freshman. Um, family went there. So it was just sort of like, well, that's, that's the place you go. Um, I had a marvelous experience at Indiana Wesleyan University. Um, but it's the first time in my life that the majority of students were not Westland. So my best friend, most of my best friends, they're Baptists, they're non-denominational, they're different kinds of um, denominations that I have no experience of. And they're those people that I've just heard these like whispered um, dismissals of. Um, so we would have these conversations about things like eschatology, um, passage of the scripture, and we would have these rip-roaring debates on Friday nights. It would be so fun. And then at the end of the night, we would be like, oh, but you know, it's not essential, and I'll see you tomorrow in the coffee <laughs> shop, okay. But something about this ring, like, but why is it not essential? Are we sure? Yeah. And so, again, that it was just an unease, but I didn't know where to look, and so I couldn't fully admit the question into my consciousness right. at this point. Yeah, the essential, the unessential, right? Is it itself such an important question? What's right. essential? The baptism, the salvation, the eschatology? What's How do you even know? Right, right. right? Yeah. Um, so also during this period, there's a few strands that are kind of laying the stage that I'm not aware that's what's happening mm -hmm. at all. Um, Indiana West at the time was very, um, so we had mandatory chapel, services Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I had no problem with that. Um, I had been on that cusp. Um, I was born in 86. So like I, I grew up with hymns or gospel choruses. We called hymns, a mixture of those, but also some of like the newer church songs, which slowly um, in the early 2000s became more praise and worship stuff. So I'm, I'm at Indiana Westland and lots of praise and worship in chapels. And at first I think this is great. And as time goes by, I'm experiencing this very raw frustration of I'm having this emotional experience. But on the other side of it, we had something called Summit, which is like a revival um, for three nights at the end of every, at the beginning of every semester. And so we, the chapel speaker would then come and we would have these revival um, meetings in the evening. And I would have this experience of like God's closeness and emotional high. But then when Summit was over, I was still the same struggling person who couldn't have, like there was no internal change that was leading me consistently closer to God. Like I'm still reading my Bible. I'm still trying to pray. Later, I, I would, I can use the phrase, like I felt kind of emotionally manipulated. Um, and and uh, emotions in prayer had always been difficult for me because growing up in the church, I would, my emotional responses are not what most people's are. And so there would be testifying nights on Sunday nights at church. And, you know, I remember feeling acutely uncomfortable as these women are sharing and weeping. And I'm just like, 
I, I'm not feeling what I'm supposed to be feeling, which kind of went back to the question of, am I saved? Well, I don't feel saved. And so this frustration of like, well, how do I know? Like, how, how do I, how do I know what's true? Are my emotions a measure of that? So this, this dissatisfaction is sort of um, happening during this time. And my sophomore year, I was part of John Wesley Honors College on campus. And as um, Dr. Riggs, he died last year, um, very suddenly young, but he established this um, chapel called Coram Deo. And it was like an alternative to the mainstream praise and worship chapel. And it wasn't, the interesting thing was, it was eventually stopped because people who weren't in honors college were flocking to this. Hmm. Um, and it was essentially the Anglican Book of Common Prayer liturgical service. And so I started going to this and I was like, this is prayer. This is prayer that's not referential to me. It's not referential to how I feel. And I can enter into it and speak these sacred words no matter where I'm at today. And the point of it is not to receive an emotional experience. The point of it is to render right worship to God. And so I was very moved by this, standing next to people that like, maybe I don't have a close relationship or even butt heads with on campus, but I'm praying the creed with them. I'm praying the Our Father. We were so low church as the, the form of Westlands that I was raised. I don't remember ever praying the Lord's Prayer in church in my whole life. I knew it, and I'm not sure how I knew it because we never prayed it. Um, the closest thing to liturgy we had was one of our pastors had us sing the doxology um, every Sunday. Mm, and I, I love the doxology, but like I needed somewhere firmer to stand. Um, so that's happening in the course of this. Um, I'm also, for one of my classes, I don't honestly remember which class it was, I had to visit churches of different traditions. So for the first time in my life, I go to a Lutheran church. I go to an Anglican church. Um, there's a very high church Anglican church in Marion called Gethsemane, beautiful. I go to a Presbyterian church. I go to Catholic mass for the first time ever. And <laughs> I went into mass, I asked my friend to take me, I didn't have a car. And um, I literally walked in thinking, I'm walking into the territory of demons. Like, I was going to ask, yeah, they're was, idolatrous, yeah, okay. right? So yeah. I walk in expecting to feel all sorts of interior turmoil, like the enemies here. And instead, it just feels like church. Like, they're in pews, they're singing, like, this feels like church. And I'm more disturbed by the normalcy and the lack of, like, spiritual red flags than anything that I yeah. hear there. So all of these things are happening. Um, I'm studying history. And so I'm studying, my, my area of interest is England and it's Reformation England. So context is very important to me. After visiting all of these churches, I'm realizing they all have a liturgical structure that was entirely foreign to me. Um, they have a lectionary of readings, they have the homily, they have the Lord's Prayer, um, they all have the Eucharist, which we had communion quarterly. And honestly, it didn't figure anywhere in my interior life. Hmm. I always was trying to like, manufacture pious feelings around it because right. I felt like I was this was supposed to matter. I've read scripture. I know this is supposed to matter, but it doesn't seem to matter. And it's also not, I remember as a child sitting in the fellowship hall um, on the counter of the kitchen after a communion Sunday and like drinking the we leftover Welch's out of the, the glasses. Like it wasn't sacred or set apart. It was something we were using, but of course it was a symbol. So okay, like this doesn't strike me, but I, I'm desirous of encountering the meaning in this. But is the meaning just something that I feel? Is it just something in me? So again, it's that same fundamental um, question or problem. Um, so anyway, I'm aware they all have this structure and I have enough historical knowledge to know they're all going back. They're all getting it from the Catholic Church. But the Catholic Church is still not on the table as an option. Um, about this time, one of my good friends, Jake, who came into the church later, um, he was raised Baptist and he comes to me and he wants to talk about the Westland doctrine of entire sanctification. And I'm just horrified by this because this drives nowhere with my experience. It's this idea that there's a second outpouring of grace in which you 
are entirely sanctified so that you don't sin anymore. And I call my dad <laughs> and I, I, I remember standing at my dorm window very clearly looking at Nebraska Street and I call my dad and I'm like, we don't actually believe this. And he, he, he like hymns and haws and says, well, I, I mean, it's, it's in the Westland Church discipline, but he never taught me and finding out later he didn't teach me because it didn't drive with his experience sure. and he didn't. So I hang up the phone and I'm standing there alone in my college dorm room and I say, well, I'm not Westland. I don't know what I am, but I'm not Westland because that can't be true. Um, also seeing, I think intuiting and seeing from people that I loved danger in this doctrine of right. you have to deny your sin and call it a weakness instead of repent and be purified of your sin if you've received the second outpouring of grace. So I knew I wasn't Westland. I go to these other churches. I know they're all hearkening back to Catholicism, but this is just nowhere on the table for me still. Um, the church I'm attending at the time, maybe most young people are like this. It's like, it's the answer, right? They're doing the people thing instead of the program thing. But at the end of the day, realizing it does come back to how much you're willing to do. And I'm looking for a faith that's about being, and I don't have that language at the time. So again, I'm frustrated. And about this time, I, I stopped going to church not because I've walked away from the Lord and not because I doubt Jesus, but because I don't know where to find him and I always leave bitter, frustrated, and judgmental, which now I know like it was my criticism of self that was causing me to judge these other people. Um, but I'm just not seeing like authentic Christianity lived out, but I don't even know what that means. I just know that I'm not seeing it. So those were like the sort of laying the, yeah. the framework for this tipping point sure. of um, what came next. Well, we'll take a break here in a, in a couple minutes, but it, you know, it's interesting. A lot of these, a lot of the, your instincts on these and the, and the theological things you're bumping up against, they come down to a lot of kind of pairs, right? Mm. Du dualities, right? Mm -hmm. Is it free, <laughs> free will or is there eternal security, right? Yeah. Or is it the emotion or is there some, some substance? Mm -hmm. You know, is it programs or people? And a, a lot of our a lot of the theological questions come down to how you resolve. Is it one or the other, or is it a both and? And you know, a lot of those. Where is that synergy? Where is that synergy? Is there a synergy? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, let's let's take a little break there, and we'll come back and pick up and <laughs> see what happens in the midst of this, of this these questions. Right. So we're joined tonight by Mother Petra. She's a nun of Christ the Bridegroom Monastery in Northeast Ohio. She's a former Wesleyan. We'll hear more about her order uh, and her vocation a little later on. Uh, but the website for that is Christ thebridegroom.org. You can find out more information there. We'll be back in just a couple minutes to hear the rest of Mother Petra's story. Uh, we'd love to hear your story. If you're a convert to the Catholic Church, uh, we'd encourage you to check out chnetwork.org, sign up for our newsletter, and we'd love to hear your story. Uh, please share it with us. Uh, we'd, uh, and it's such a, a powerful way that we as Christians can uh, encourage each other, that spiritual work of mercy, of encouragement, to talk about the good things that the Lord has done in our lives. That's why we pray the Psalms over and over again. And so again, we'd love to hear your, your story. Uh, you can check out chnetwork.org for more information about our newsletter and the other things that we do at the Coming Home Network. But again, we'll be back in just a couple minutes to hear the rest of Mother Petra's story. We'll see you then. Good evening. Welcome back to the program. We're entering the second half of our hour tonight, speaking with Mother Petra, a nun of Christ the Bridegroom Monastery in Northeastern Ohio. She's a former Wesleyan, and we, we've heard a bit about your story so far, you know, the background in Wesleyanism, uh, and then coming up against these, these theological conundrums, you know, free will uh, versus, you know, eternal security, programs and people, emotions and substance, and, you know, and all the questions that those as, have you know, gave rise to in your life, mm -hmm. questions of, you know, how do I make sense of my experience with these things? You know, I think we left off, you're just kind of in <laughs> the midst yeah. of a lot of these yeah. questions. So uh, pick us back up there. What happens next? So it was, it was pretty much like the ground had been prepared, but I didn't know that. Mm. So that's the end of my sophomore year. I come home for the summer. My sister um, graduated the year before me. She moved to Anderson, South Carolina to work at a Baptist school. 
So she comes home from this Baptist school and she tells me and my parents that she's going to start RCIA and she's going to become Catholic. This sends shockwaves. And I'm immediately like, no, you're not, because they worship Mary and they think the Pope is perfect and they don't read the Bible. And oh yeah, they're idolatrous. Do you know about transubstantiation? I'm very horrified by this. <laughs> and, but she calmly listens, she speaks with me and she wants to give me these books. And God forgive my hubris, I was like, I'm your intellectual superior. I will read your books and prove you wrong because clearly you haven't thought about this. One of the books she gave me is David Curry's Born Fundamentalist, Born Again Catholic. Okay. So I start reading this book immediately. And what is the foundation of it except the question of authority, which is what I needed. But the experience initially was not one of relief. It was an experience of um, realizing I had no authority. She, I remember sitting in a coffee shop with her and she said, why do you believe the Bible? And I said, because all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, 2 Timothy 3.16. And she said, when Paul wrote that, that only meant the Old Testament. Try again. And I said, well, because, because it's in the canon of scripture. Well, where did the canon of scripture, scripture come from? Well, the Council of Nicaea, which actually I don't even think that was the council, but that's what I told her at the time. And she said, and what kind of council was that? And I'm just feeling backed into a corner and I'm like, a church council. <laughs> and she's like, what church? <laughs> well, and at this point inside, I'm freaking out. The Catholic church. I felt like somebody in one of those cartoons who, when they run off a cliff and they don't know that they run off the cliff and they keep, and then they just plummet. Right. It was like, I thought I'd been standing on solid ground my whole life and suddenly it tipped and I was just free falling. And she tried to like console me of like, you're standing on Jesus. And yet, how did I even, sh she didn't then say this, but inside, how do I even know who Jesus is if I don't have authority? Like, how do I even know? So I'm reading the David Curry book and he goes very clearly through the question of authority. How do we know it is true? How do we know that scripture is true? Is there an interpreting authority for scripture? And his, his historical argument is Jesus Christ founded a church. He founded apostles. He handed on the gospel and dogma to these men. And to this day through apostolic succession, we receive this truth. I have nothing. I, I cannot argue in the face of history. I'm studying history. So like clearly this is a really important part to me. Um, but then the subtle thing of well, if they have authority and Christ gave them authority, that means the Eucharist is true and I can only receive him in the Eucharist, Christ in the Eucharist through the Catholic Church. And I had this immense and almost immediate thirst. I needed the Eucharist. It was like all of my objections, Mary, the Pope, they were ancillary. I needed those answered and I did get them right. answered over the next couple of years. Um, but I needed the Eucharist and I needed to know it was true. Yeah. So um, I'm about ready to go back to school and I take a walk with my dad at my grandma's along these railroad tracks and I'm telling him about my reading and I'm just opening all these things to him and I'm really expecting and wanting him to say to me, you haven't thought of this. Like, this is why it's not true. I'm wanting my world to be knit back together right. to where I'm comfortable. And instead he listens for a solid hour, hour and a half. And then he goes, I think maybe, I think maybe you're right. And I'm like, that was not how this was supposed to go. Yeah. Because now there's only one way forward. So over the next months, anytime I call home, I'm picking fights with my dad um, because He's reading her books now in a different state. I'm in Indiana, he's in Ohio. And I'm being belligerent because I want him to talk me out of this and he's just not doing that. Um, and then I come home for Thanksgiving and he and I are having a, a row in the kitchen and my poor mom is in the, the next room looking at the television, just acting like this isn't happening in her house because this is her worst nightmare. And we're going back and forth and I think he's befuddled, like why are you arguing and finally, I stamp my foot and I say, I know what's true, but I don't want it to be. And 
all of the fight goes out of me and I just wilt. And he came and wrapped his arms around me and he said, I know, me too. And it was like at that point I knew that there was only one way to go, whatever that cost. I didn't want this and yet I did because I wanted the truth. I had a professor um, who mentored me. He was like a, a spiritual father to me um, who during this time as I'm talking with him, he just keeps telling me, follow the truth wherever it leads. Wherever it leads, you have to follow it. And, and he had this phrase, you never have to be afraid of true truth. And so this is echoing in my ears and I just keep treasuring this in my heart when I'm about to turn back. No, I don't have to be afraid of true truth. And I have to follow the truth wherever it goes or there's going to be no peace. Um, so eventually I, I start RCAA and I, I prepare to come into the church. Um, in the course of that time, I got my other questions answered. My, my roommate at the time, my best friend, Sarah Black, she, um, she asked me all of the really, really, really hard questions. And I tease her, like, you put me through hell because um, she came in the next year. But it was really her pressing me for the answers that made me have to go find the answers because I had to find a way to explain to this person who loved me so much why I was doing this because it was coming from a place of such deep concern, right? Right, right. Um, and so that was actually a great gift in disguise of, okay, now I have to, now I have to know why. Now I have to know the answers. Sure. Um, well, talk us through some of those. Because mm -hmm. you'd mentioned a few earlier that even though you had this sense that if, if this is true, the authority, the mm -hmm. Eucharist, then I... There's one direction, but there's still these things that are going to need to be answered. Right. What, what did you discover so, about those? Mary, for yeah. starters. Yeah. Um, they don't, we don't. I, my pronouns are so confused. <laughs> I, my pronouns are confused <laughs> in my life. Um, <laughs> Catholics don't worship Mary. We ask her to pray for us. Well, that is not what I understood growing up. You know, if someone's going to this statue, it looks like they're worshiping. But actually, it's like when I call my aunt or my grandma and I say, this is happening. Would you please pray for me? Interestingly, as a child, my grandpa died when I was five and I was very close to him. And I had this sense that there shouldn't be this total rupture in our relationship. But I also knew that like once the dead are dead, they're gone. And so I never told anybody this, but I would ask Jesus to pass messages on to my grandpa hmm. because I had this sense of like, well, if he's with you, then I should still be in relationship with him. So it was like intuitively, I had a sense of the communion of saints that just because somebody dies doesn't mean they're cut off from the body of Christ and they're still in relationship with us. And so of course, if he's with Jesus, he's gonna talk to Jesus about me because he loves me. Right. So this is what Mary's doing for yeah. us. I'm coming to see her, the typology in scripture of Mary. Like she is the Ark of the New Covenant. She is the new Eve. She is the fulfillment of Israel. She is the epitome, the example, and the promise for every Christian yeah. that we will have this union for God. We are to say, be it done to me according to your will. We will be taken up into heaven. And so seeing her not as a threat, but as a, a companion on the journey, mm -hmm. um, it was many years, honestly, before I had what I would consider a relationship with sure. Mary. I had an intellectual understanding and I was, I remember asking before I entered the church, can I be a good Catholic and never pray the rosary? Yeah. And I was assured I could. I love the rosary, but it took me some years to get there. Yeah. Um, as far as the Pope goes, I went to visit my sister in South Carolina and she took me to her priest, Father Jim, and I sat down with him. I'd never met a Catholic priest in my life. And I had out my list of questions. They all sounded offensive. And I was like, I'm sorry, I don't know how to ask these in a way that doesn't sound offensive. <laughs> and he was so good. Um, but one of the things I talked to him about was papal authority. I'm like, history here. I'm like, so what? William the Conqueror comes into England under a papal banner. Am I supposed to believe that's okay? Like that the Normans should have invaded England because the Pope says it's okay. And so he had to talk me through like, what does it actually, what does papal authority mean and what does it not mean? Right. Um, so that was clearing up a lot of those, those issues for me. Um, the scripture issue, like Catholics do read the Bible, but our, our liturgies are scripture. They're yeah. like 80 or 90% scripture. So how can I say that like they don't read the Bible and also they have the authority to, the church has the authority to um, help us interpret and understand scripture. So it's not all of these competing, yeah. um, it's the one continuous authentic voice going back to apostolic times. Um, 
So those things were cleared sure. up. Um, well, in the Eucharist issue, we go, to go back to that for a moment again, that mm-hmm. that is a big deal, especially for someone, again, who, 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 as you said, you wrestled with your relationship with God, or, or what does it mean? How do I know it's there? Where do the emotions fit? All that kind of question. Mm-hmm. If, if it's even possible mm-hmm. that Christ has given us this gift of His presence in the Eucharist, that question is not an unimportant question. It is a central question. Is this, is this a means to union? And what do I want with God? I want union with God. Yeah. Um, it, the interesting thing is, it also resolved, regarding the Eucharist, the emotional question, because if the church says it, and the yeah. church with the authority of Christ says it, then it doesn't matter what I feel, He's there. Right. And it's the eyes of faith, but it's also something outside of myself that I can say objectively, mm-hmm. He is there, yeah. and so I am receiving Him. Um, so I have my Easter vigil in 2009. Yeah. Um, I come into the church. My parents came in that same night, um, which that was a miracle with my mom. Um, my I went through our stay in Indiana, but we came in so my sister could be at one place. She came in the year before. Her patron was Monica, and she chose Monica because she was going to pray for us to come oh, into the church. Beautiful. And a year after that, I'm in Rome at Monica's tomb, and I'm saying, thank you. You are a quick worker. You brought us, you brought us all. <laughs> um, but that night when the priest put the chrism on my head and he said, Julian, be sealed with the Holy Spirit. My confirmation saint was Julian of Norwich. I had this very keen sense of through all of the ages, through apostolic succession, Jesus Christ was reaching down through human flesh to claim me. And I hadn't like understood what was happening at confirmation because that hadn't really been one of my issues, right? I'm like, this is what we have to do. Um, But when I received the Eucharist, so I was raised in the, Protestant purity culture, which is a whole nother conversation. Um, But in the midst of that, there was like a sense of, well, just wait, um, just wait, and then you'll get married and everything will be fulfilled. Like all of this waiting, all this absence, all of this self-denial. And yet the minute the Eucharist touched my lips, I just started weeping and I'm kind of embarrassed. I'm kneeling between strangers in the front of the church and all these people are going by to receive the body and I cannot stop weeping. But the only thing that's, if I had known this prayer at the time, what I felt was Simeon's prayer, Lord, now let your servant go in peace. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I really believe this is the moment my vocation was born because I thought there is nothing left in this. Like there is nothing more than this in this world. Um, I had been pinning my, my, you know, little hopes on, well, finally I'll get married and I'll have, I'll have that, that closeness. And I was like, nothing in the world, nothing can ever come close to God in me. And and that was just overwhelming. I was thoroughly unprepared, um, having had no emotional experience. And and at other times, this is not a normative experience. It was a grace I was given. Not everyone's given this grace at that moment. They're given a grace, a different grace. Mm -hmm. Um, But that was the moment of you are in this bread and you are in my body. And what does that mean? Um, What does it mean that you are in me? Um, Which opened the door to theosis and just the rest of the course of my life. Right, right. Well, I, let's let's talk a little bit about your vocation, how you ended up, mm-hmm. you know, bring bring us to the present. But then I have some some of these topics I want to zero back, yeah. or circle back around on. Um, yeah. So it was eight years before okay. I entered the monastery. I just lived happily as I mean, I fully intended to be married. I was in grad school, and I remember this moment when, um, as part of the purity culture, I was taught to pray for my future husband. I think my grandparents probably prayed for my future husband. Um, and there's this day in grad school when I'm, I'm working on a paper at my desk and I get up to go across the room and out of habit, um, I'm praying for him. And I think, well, for the first time, I think if he's alive, he's alive. Like, it's not like he'll just appear when I meet him. <laughs> like he's doing something right now. He's eating or he's working or he's studying or he's sleeping or he's sinning. He's doing something. And then I had this thought, or he doesn't exist. <laughs> what? This had never been anywhere in my mind. He doesn't exist. But now that I was Catholic, I had to be open to the possibility that like that wasn't God's will. Like in my in my Protestant life, God's will is that everybody get married. Celibacy was just not a thing. Right. Um, interestingly, there's I have five um, aunts, great aunts, and, and another aunt who aren't married who've given me a very um, 
fruitful image of a single life of service and love. And so um, I think on some level that helped me be open, but that wasn't in my conscious thought. Right, right. So I continue. I like, I hate this thought. I put the lid on and I continue on. And so for the next few years, like I'm still looking, right? I'm still, but like, how do you find a good Catholic man and particularly um, one who can interface with all of the, the, it's not baggage, it's the accoutrements of, sure. of, of your past, right. my past. Um, and then um, I'm, I go through a period of illness and some intense interior suffering. And in the midst of that, I come across a quote from St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. Actually, it's a quote from her before she was Teresa Benedicta. Uh. She wrote it in a letter in 1920, Edith Stein. And she said, whenever I face my own powerlessness to influence people directly, I become more keenly aware of the necessity of my own Holocaust. And I was struck that she's using that phrase, the necessity of my own Holocaust, years before she is burnt in the ovens of Auschwitz. She's this like mind of the 20th century, and yet she goes to Carmel. She's buried in a monastic life. And this does something fundamental in me for the first time I understood the nature of suffering and that suffering mattered, that my suffering mattered, and that it was a means of union with the Lord. Because Protestantism didn't give me an answer to suffering. Right. Um, and, and this is one of the fundamental questions of, of human experience. So that was the beginning of me realizing or, or having an inkling of like, Lord, you're asking me into a union with you that precludes human marriage because I need to give myself fully here in, in whatever crosses you're giving me. Um, so that was the beginning of that. And then um, slowly I was like, well, that's fine. Like, I'll just live as a single Catholic. That's great. I don't need to, um, I don't need to do anything formal about that. Um, but there was a, a priest in my life who became my spiritual director for five years. And um, as I'm, I'm writing to him, talking to him about this, he, he's just like, no, um, your vocation matters not just for you, but for the church. Mm -hmm. um, and so, okay, then I need to be open to exploring this. Um, I, I discern with some communities I'm really on the path to consecrated virginity at, after a few years um, and ready, like ready to submit my application to be received into formation in our diocese with the bishop. I have the application. Um, and then I go visit the monastery for a Pustinia. It's just a, just a retreat. Like I have zero intention um, of becoming a nun, especially a Byzantine nun. Um, but during my, my retreat, I'm asking the Lord um, about timing because Father Patrick had taught me, um, I'm, I was just like terrified of doing the wrong thing. And he was like, put the whole burden on Jesus. He called it telling Jesus to be a man. So just tell him like, he has to let you know. You don't have to figure it out. He has to let you know. And so I said, Lord, I think it's time to submit this application to the bishop. You need to let me know if it's not. And he said to me, it's one of the very few times in my life that there's very clear words not from me, from exteriorly. And he said in my heart, be poor with me. To be poor is to be dependent, trust me. And I was like, oh, that's great. But that's not what I asked. I don't understand how this, what this means. The next morning, I went for divine liturgy. I've never been at divine liturgy ever in my life. And in the middle of the liturgy, um, I'm just overwhelmed with this keen sense of belonging that makes me panic because I'm like, this is an utterly unfamiliar tradition. These nuns are strangers to me. I don't want this. I'm gonna be a consecrated virgin. I'm going through this in my head with the Lord. And then I'm like, wait, panic is never of God. <laughs> so I said, Lord, if this, is, if this is you, you need to tell me later, not right now. Right now I'm supposed to be worshiping. Within like two minutes, it entirely dissipates to the point that I just forget it completely. Mm -hmm. um, then that afternoon, I meet with Father Patrick for spiritual direction and I had spent the afternoon with the nuns. It's a long story. And um, he said, how do you feel being here? And I was like, oh, it's great. And it makes me a little sad because I know it's not for me. And I just want to go merrily along. And he goes, no, not how do you feel about how you feel? Just how do you feel? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I 
feel like I've come home. And then I just like gaped at him in, in just horror. <laughs> and he said, yeah, you, you need to listen to that. Um, and so that unleashed this path of discernment. Mm. Like I didn't, I was the happiest Roman Catholic. I didn't desire to change rights. Um, and exp- just again, even, even right. Catholics so, are not familiar right. with so what So Byzantine what that Catholics means. are, our prayer mm-hmm. looks orthodox. Sure. It looks like the Eastern Orthodox Church of the various churches, mm-hmm. but we're in union with the Bishop of Rome. So the traditions are kept sort of like in the Anglican ordinary. Right. Their traditions are kept, um, but instead of praying for the patriarch, we're praying for the Pope because we're in union there. Yeah. Um, and so the prayer is looks very different. It sounds mm-hmm. very different. It smells very different. Yeah. And this was a struggle, but it was very clear that the Lord was leading me every step and asking me to do this. Yeah. Um, and coming to realize, he was saying to me, I want you to be attached to me and not how you want me to taste and sound and smell and feel. I want you to be attached to me. And so it was like the loss of my Roman tradition was immediate and the gain was gradual and I had to have enough trust that he wasn't going to leave me empty. I had to to relinquish and sit here empty and trust that he would fill me with himself. And he did. I then had a monastic conversion. I then like my heart's been so formed in the East and realizing that this is the medicine the Lord has for my particular soul. Mm. Like he created me to be an Eastern Catholic because that's the medicine for my particular soul and my wounds. Right. Um, and I would never have chosen that. It was something out of obedience that then became one of the deepest gifts of my life. Mm. Um, but it was a shock. It was a great yeah. surprise. Well, it's a really interesting point. Again, that one that, that it, I think that is part of, uh, in the Lord's providence, part of what it means to be Catholic in the broadest sense is that the, the church helps us to find that that piece yes. that completes where we're mm-hmm. <laughs> where we're in need, where we need healing. Uh, so we have different temperaments, different personalities, different backgrounds, and some some aspects of the church of the faith are very comfortable, mm-hmm. familiar, and then there's those other parts that sometimes. The Lord brings us to to, to iron us out, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, it's it's a form of stripping, mm. um, but He never strips out of cruelty. Right. He does it as preparation for the gift of Himself. Right, um, and that call <laughs> it calls for tremendous faith, and it also makes us cry out for faith because we realize we don't have it. Right. Um, I think it was actually the. I think He brought me to the monastic life to realize I didn't know what faith was, mm. and I didn't have faith of um, the deeper kind yeah. so that I could beg for it. Because if I had continued living in the world, I would have continued under this illusion that, oh, I've got faith, I'm fine, but I'm not. Yeah. Um, and so it created, carved out this empty place that he could enter with his grace. Yeah. Um, That's a great reminder. Again, that it's, in some sense, you know, we on this show we come on and we share our conversion story, but in some sense it's the story of Many points of conversion, mm-hmm. and they'll and they're not they don't end once we become Catholic. <gasps> Obviously, there's a well, mm-hmm. there's the next turning point that, that the Lord leads us to, and we're all we're all in that, mm-hmm. you know, Catholics, lifelong Catholics and yeah. converts alike. So, we have about six minutes left. Um, and one topic I wanted to, to circle back around on, and it you know it, it threads through a number of different things you talked about, but it's it's sort of behind a lot of the theological logical questions is sort of the sacramental worldview. Of, of faith, you know, I was thinking actually of, when you're talking about Mary, working through the issues on Mary. It's one of the issues that's that's kind of behind the question of Mary, and we, we don't worship Mary, but we do pray to her, and we 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 honor her, we reverence her, is sort of that, that question of, you know, does God work through people? Mm. Does He sanctify people? Mm. Even even the questions of kind of the the Wesleyan view of sanctification and works mm. and grace and all that kind of stuff. The question of like do do I actually become holy through this process, yeah. or does God just kind of like turn his turn a blind right. eye to my right. sins? That's a that's a big kind of overarching question of mm-hmm. God's relationship. What does He do with stuff with people? Right. You know? Like I think that we would have said, well, of course, Jesus is God and Jesus is man. Right. Um, but what does it mean? What does the incarnation mean, and what does it mean? What are the practical implications for us? Right. Um, we're in our post-festive of Ascension right now. Um, well, I've never known what to do with Ascension in the past. Like, it seems really sad. Jesus goes up to heaven and he says, don't worry, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. But 
He's taking us in our entirety, in our humanity, to the right hand of the Father. We are sitting at the right hand of the Father in the person of Jesus Christ. And coming to recognize that salvation, in the East we use the word theosis, which means divinization, not in a new agey way, but like we become sons of the Father through baptism. It's divine filiation. In this mystery, we like, there's the Godhead, and Jesus is in the Godhead, but we're in Jesus. So we're that close to God. Yeah. And it's not something exterior to us. It's in, like, realizing this has been the, one of the conversions of the past few years, hmm. realizing that the Lord pr primarily, like, I was always looking for exterior guidance. Like, what do you want me to do? Um, I was very suspicious, suspicious of signs, but, like, still looking for some kind of guidance. Um well, the Lord primarily guides the mature Christian by inclining their heart. And to us, it's indistinguishable. We think it's us. But if he's imminent, if God is imminent, if he is in creation and in us, mm -hmm. he's guiding us by the inclination of our own heart, which doesn't mean that doesn't need to be tested against the church, against mm -hmm. your spiritual father, um, against what you already know to be revealed truth. Yeah. But that's like a level of intimacy and closeness that I had no conception of um, growing up. It was like there were so many rules, but these for me um, were to assure myself that I, if as long as I did these things, then I wouldn't be cast out. As long as I did these things, then I could have some sort of like sureness that I was close to him. Right. Um, and all of that's just utterly unnecessary because he's in, he's in me. He's in you, mm -hmm. not just when you receive the Eucharist. But like in your humanity, yeah. he has taken flesh. And when you suffer, he suffers. Yeah. Like our suffering is a participation in the passion of Christ. And so also it's a, partic a participation in the whole Paschal mystery. Mm -hmm. Like it's bringing forth redemption for our souls, for other souls. It's bringing us into a union of love, mm -hmm. which only leads to joy. That sanctifies everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you know, you, it takes me back to again talking about the emotions and the heart. There, you're, getting, you're bringing up. It, it helps us understand where that fits, right? We in we, we have this blessing of the church of the sacraments mm -hmm. where we we know we can know intellectually, you know where the truth is, what is true, where God is, where He shows up, and so then we bring our hearts to that. And sometimes our our hearts are ready, and sometimes our hearts are conflicted, but we bring them up to be sanctified and reordered, mm -hmm. uh, so that the, again. They're not unimportant, no. but they're to be sanctified and purified. And God does that so that we imitate Christ in his intellect, in his will, but also in our hearts, which are mm -hmm. inclined more and more yeah. towards him. To be ordered and formed. It's in Ezekiel, you know, God says, I take your heart of stone yes. and I give you a heart of flesh. Well, actually, he's given us the heart of Christ. Yeah. It's not just flesh. It's divine flesh, right? Yes. Divinity took the flesh. sacred heart. Yeah. And so... That seems so far from what I thought relationship with God was, but like that's the mystery of everything. Right. Oh, beautiful. Well, I have just a, a, a minute or so left. If there's somebody who has been listening, who's watching, who has come from a similar background to you, and maybe they're, 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 they're deep in those questions, maybe that mm -hmm. place of seeing these dualities, seeing these questions, seeing these theological inconsistencies, do, would you have a word of encouragement to them to take the next, <laughs> what, the, the next step? Yeah. Um, I would tell them exactly what Dr. Smith told me, which is follow the truth wherever it goes and don't be afraid of true truth. And yet I would also put this trust that he's leading you to the truth. Yeah. It's not something you have to go figure out. He's drawing you. And if you are seeking and asking, there's a very famous prayer of, I think Thomas Merton that starts, Lord, I have no idea where I am going. <laughs> um, I had this tacked on my, above my desk during those years. Um, so just Google that phrase, see if you can find the prayer. But he says something like, I know the desire to please you does in fact please you. I don't know if what I'm doing pleases you, but I know that the desire to please you pleases you. Like yeah. he's a gentle father. And I think all of us need to relearn who God the father is. Um, and so in that journey, he's not holding out and going, well, good luck. I hope you figure it out. He's saying, I know, come, I'm taking your hand. You don't even feel my hand in yours, but I'm taking it. I'm leading you, so yeah. keep searching. Um, don't be afraid. Because yeah. that moment, whether it's when you receive your communion or whether you're welcomed into the kingdom in heaven, 
it's worth everything it costs. And it costs a lot. Like, we can't sugarcoat that. It costs a lot, but it's worth it because he's everything. He's the fulfillment. Amen. Well, Mother Petra, we are out of time, and I don't even know if we covered uh, Mother Petra, you know, but well, but I think if people check out ChristTheBridegroom.org, they'll find out more about the monastery, the order, yeah. uh, and, your, and your role there. So thank you for your story and for your work. Thank you. It's awesome. been a joy. Now, and thank you for joining us for this episode of the, the Journey Home program. I pray that Mother Petra's story has been an inspiration to you. We'll encourage you on your journey, just taking the next right step, trusting that the Lord is leading you. We'll be back again next week with another story. Uh, in the meantime, uh, God bless you. Pray for us. We're praying for you. See you then.